join internationally acclaimed overland expert Paul Marsh and award-winning journalist Gregory Simpson as they delve into all things responsible overlanding. From choosing the right vehicle, getting yourself prepared, getting your vehicle prepared, safety tips, and much, much more. Only on Responsible Overlanding. Okay, Luke, the shoulder guy, asked he's got a 100 series uh, V8 uh, with 200k on the clock. Uh, what are some of the strengths and weaknesses of, the, of this particular vehicle? Look, it's, um, that's going to have an independent front suspension. So you know, most of the older vehicles have got a solid axle in the front. And this one's got two arms on either side, uh, so basically independent, the wheels can move independently. And those were prone to some weakness on the lower, the lower ball joints, on the, on the actual, where the, where the wheels hook on, so you had ball joints at low. So that's always important that, that you look after those and change them. You know, if it's got 200,000 on the clock, that's probably the time to do some preventative maintenance on the vehicle. And, you know, when a vehicle's done a mileage, like say 200,000, and you're going, I'm going to take this vehicle, I'm going to drive on a big trip with it. You know? So if you understand the weaknesses, you can actually sort them out. You can say, what are the weaknesses of this truck? So the lower ball joints we found from experience, they, they're ones that can and do wear out. Uh, shock absorbers were another problem. And then also the front um, suspension on the independent front suspension would more often than not, if you're driving quite aggressively, you would you tend to bottom them out more often. So then you could have cracks. I'm saying they do crack, you can have cracks. Um, and, and that's something to look out for. So again, you know, is is it actually is it actually set up properly? You know, um, are the torsion bars all properly um, set? If it's, if it's done two hundred thousand kilometers, you might want to change those. And uh, the differentials, I. Just from memory, I think the early ones had a two pinion differential, um, which means two little gears, and the later ones had four gears and planetary gears inside the differential in the front, so they were stronger with the four with the four gear planetary gear set. Uh, so that's something to look out for. Those were one of the small problems. That, that's a, you, you touched on a key point: uh, solid versus independent front suspension. Um, big are, talking point. It's a big talking point. Listen, both will get you. 80%, maybe 90% of where you want to go, okay? So if someone said to me, oh, I'm not going to take 100 series, I said, why not? It's a good truck, okay? You might have to, if you understand the weak points of that vehicle and you know what to check for, you're just going to check those more often. You're going to drive being more mindful of those weak points, you know? You're not going to want to bottom out the front suspension all the time because you know that you're putting a lot more strain on the lower wishbones. So you need good and quality suspension. So good quality shock absorbers, good quality... You Some pp 50 ones. So again, it's, it, is about, uh, it is about understanding those weak points. And when you understand the weak points, you can drive it in the parameters of that and you can actually do the checks to mitigate any problems that might come up. So nothing wrong with that. Okay? Uh, you're going to have less articulation on, on the, with the independent front suspension, so it's you know it's it's a small it's a small difference for some people. More less yeah. articulation than independent on the front. Well, you've got the articulation, should I say? But it, let's assume that um, if you go you, into you're some ruts, you're going to lose your ground yeah, clearance. Yeah, That's yeah, a better way exactly. to explain it. It's not so much you know that. It's more you lose your ground clearance. Um, so yes, that's a better way. And that, that all these reasons is what makes the eighty series. Arguably the best of the best. Well, it's, is it the, you know, I, I had a, a debate with a client yesterday, actually, and we talked about exactly that. Were we going to go for the station wagon as, as, as opposed to the double cap, okay, the double cap with a canopy on the back? And he wanted to go for the station wagon initially for reasons it's more comfortable, and we added up a lot of reasons. When I understood what he wanted to do with the vehicle, there was no way that vehicle was going to work. You know, because for, for one, he, he's got... Two children. Uh, secondly, what he wanted to carry with him, including a paramotor, you know, <laughs> which I would happily take on my trips. Uh, um, for people that don't understand, what's a paramotor? Okay, so um, yeah, a paramotor is a great device that you strap an engine on your back and you start it up, and as you run, the wing comes up uh, above okay. you and you fly. Okay, I, I have a passion for for that. Nice. And uh, so, so that said, it, he wouldn't have had the space differently. So by the time we discussed the bigger picture, it narrowed it down to one vehicle that he was going to need to use. Trailer? Yeah, we talked about that option as well. A trailer has its place. 
okay again where he wants to travel quite remote into zambian places mm -hmm. and quite a lot of wild areas you know try reversing a trailer when you've got elephants coming towards you it's yeah. a little bit difficult and it doesn't mean sand. to say yeah it doesn't mean to say you can't use it people <clears> do <throat> and there's let's not take it away trailer has its place it absolutely does but understand how you're going to use it where you're going to use it the time it takes to set up the trailer the time it takes to pack it away Understand all those parameters and then again make your decision based on knowledge and you've had, and some experience. Now the worst thing you can do is go and buy a trailer and you've never opened and closed it and rather go and rent one and try it. Sitting in a garage for three years because yeah. you figured out you don't need it. You don't need it. <laughs> so yeah, so get, getting back to that vehicle, I think that um, the, the 100 series has got more electronics on it. So um, I'll, I'll probably steer less away, more more away from the 100 series because I do favor the in, the uh, solid live axle in the front. But that's a personal thing. You know? And the 79, is, thankfully they're still sold new. Do you normally go buy a new one for your clients or second hand or obviously both, a bit of both? Both, yeah, yeah. It depends, you know, it just depends what people want to spend. And uh, do, you, do you have people come to you with obviously different budgets? I mean, mm. should people be scared? I don't want to come speak to Paul because I'm not sure if I can afford it. It's not about that at all. It's, it's not about that. You know, sometimes I'll tell someone if their budget is not going to actually build them a vehicle safely. So it's not about saying you've got to have all the money to build the most fancy vehicle because sometimes I've taken, and that's where the petrols came into, into play in a big way because I was able to buy a petrol cruiser, um, the lot available on the South African market, the 80, the 105, and you know, I bought quite a few 105s recently and quite a few petrols actually. How is this COVID affecting uh, vehicle sales? Is it easier to get cars cheaper? Um, I think... We're going to see a surge in, in cars coming on the market because I think there's a lot of companies who are not going to have the need for the vehicles they've got, be them, you know, different different avenues and travel and different avenues and game lodges and places that use these vehicles. And, and also people who can't afford them. Mm. So yes, there is going to be a so surge. So if you've got a bit of cash, this is a good time to make some moves. Yeah, and a number of my clients have done that, you know, especially those from overseas. They've gone, you know what, now's the time to mm. buy a vehicle. You know, the RAND is in their favor and finding good vehicles. So I'm looking for a good number of vehicles. So that I'm bad buying. RAND is good for Paul Marsh's business. <laughs> <laughs> the RAND is always good value. And that's one of the things I always said when I came back to South Africa, you know, you can build beautiful vehicles mm. in South Africa because it has more of a pivotal point for the world, in a sense. I mean, you do the same in Australia. Trust me, they build incredible vehicles. But everything must be twice the price. But it's, um, no, I wouldn't say, you know, I wouldn't say twice the price. I think, you know, labor is certainly more expensive. Mm. And so we have yeah, a lot of the world. Yeah, it is. Uh, but then people, people improve on how they do stuff. You know, people will, will design products that they can just bolt in. So whereas here we might fabricate it from scratch. They'll go, no, I'm going to design this on CAD and I'm going to have they it. They just love that fabrication in mm -hmm. Aussie. Yeah, the people, and look, Aussie. And in South Africa, it happens as so well. It does, absolutely. So I think we have an advantage to building vehicles here in this country uh, purely because we do have a lot of experience. We have a lot of um, people who are willing to design good products, as we have in Australia, as we have in America and Europe. So around the world globally, we just have a unique set up that people love coming to Africa. So hey, build a vehicle in Africa, fly in, do your training here, test it here, and go into Africa. It's no brainer. It's a great attraction. So yeah. And will you be making trucks until you can't see over the steering wheel? <laughs> <laughs> and I think I'll always be involved in this industry, sharing my passion with people and, and learning. You know, it's it's a great I learn every day from people, from from people who send questions in who ask different angles from the option to go and travel. So yeah, I absolutely do believe that. Absolutely. And um, Danny Zero asked, um, well, what's the reason we don't get the 79 series in, in the US of A and, and, and places in North America? You know, it's a, it's, and it's a question I actually can't answer. And, and to be honest, if I had to look at it, the 79, most of it was developed out of a need. Uh, the double cab was developed in South Africa. Uh, initially, there was a company in South Africa, in Johannesburg, Miano's, and they used to cut the single cab and build them into double Didn't cabs. Didn't Andrew have a similar thing? Um, he might have had years three ago. years ago, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but certainly, you know, they started out and of course the double cab was born into into the market from, from Japan and from Toyota. 
So it definitely has been a vehicle that's synonymous with people in Africa using Toyota. And the Toyota, because the Toyota brand has stood the test of time, it, there are not too many new models coming out all the time. I mean, the 79 series gets year in, year out, you can buy them. They're small changes, but not massive Still got the same radio. <laughs> <laughs> they've improved, they've improved. But what I do like about that is that you don't get massive changes. So to answer the question, why they're not in America, I actually don't know. I mean, there's definitely going to be on, on maybe it's emissions and some things, but the newer oh, ones, the well. newer ones definitely, and I can't answer it. Yeah. I really can't. Well, we'll do a bit of digging. We'll definitely have to here, ask man. our American counterparts. Maybe your friend Scott Brady Scott, has got a few. I need to ask Scott. Scott, I'm sure, will be able to get tell me exactly why. So that's great. <laughs> Weight and balance are critical to any build. I'm sure you'd agree with that. Look, weight's everything. You know, I think when you're looking at building a vehicle, you're looking really to take your vehicle and you want to put the weight as low down as possible between the axles. That makes it a lot safer. You're looking to try and make sure you balance it out side to side. So again, when you're looking at what you're taking on the vehicle with you, that's where it's going to come in. So you need to do a mental you know, calculation of what am I, especially if you're going for something out of the norm. You know, you want to carry a lot more water or a lot more fuel. That all adds up in weight, takes it off your, your, your allowable carrying weight. And, um, and people you, overloading, obviously a dangerous game to play. People overloading with not actually um, changing brakes and increasing brake efficiency with more effective braking. Yeah. And also you should be keeping within the general the GVR, yeah. as they say, of the vehicle, gross vehicle mass allowable. And, and it's important that, that when you're looking at equipment to take, you go, well, do I need that? How can I take it? Uh, yeah, it's very important to get that right. Less is more, as they say. Barant Lewitz asked, um, is it a good idea to do the 300 ball extension like you get in Aussie? I think that's going to definitely prove itself over time with how Andrew did it. I mean, they did it beautifully. I mean, it was very well done. It's properly engineered. It's properly jigged. I think the danger comes in when you get someone who just cuts your chassis, chassis and lengthens it and it's not done properly and it's not accurate. That, that's your problem. Um, what I like to think with the double cabs, the weight at the back, by the time you've got the heavy fuel tank at the back behind the rear axle, then you're putting a heavy sure. steel bumper, then you're putting two wheels on the back, you're putting a lot of weight at the back of the car. And actually, if I could take those wheels and I could put them behind the cab between Isn't the Isn't that the best place for your spares? Well, to me, it makes a lot more sense because we all need to carry With excessive two spares. We've got excessive. It's accessible. You know, what, if, you, if you could, you know, create that space between the, the cab and then the load body where you could put your two wheels mm. and strap them in there, you've then reduced that weight. And you've reduced the weight of a of an even heavy a heavy bumper that's designed to carry the strength of those wheels. Because remember that back bumpers had to be designed a lot stronger to carry those wheels sitting like this to keep them in place. So now you can you can reduce that amount of weight with good jacking points, good good recovery points, but it doesn't have to be as, as, as heavy. Make a massive difference in the handling. It will that together with when Toyota one day and I appeal to them to widen that axle to the proper width is very important. In, in handling. So, you know, the answer is... A company like Toyota, I could, what's you know, going it's, on there? It's, uh, <laughs> I'd love to know, I really would, and I'd love them to answer in why they haven't done it. There's no real sense, you know, why are we having to put a fix on their vehicle? Yeah. It's, it's, it's unnecessary. They've moved all their models to the wider front yeah. axle, so just adjust the rear axle and let's do it properly. So, yeah. come on Toyota, come exactly. to the party. Come to the party. And if you need some help, Paul's here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Michael says, Paul Marsh, you're a legend. Well, I couldn't agree with that more. No, that's very kind of you. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. Uh, he wants us to make a video about canopy access, but we'll, we'll get to that. I think, we'll, I think it's a great video, and I think we'll really do that. We need to do that when we've got a vehicle, we so we can talk through that. Exactly. And Fred asks the question everybody wants to know, would you go to, into Africa with a new Defender? Yeah. <laughs> I think Fred answered that question for yeah, me. Yeah, really. At the end, he said, you already know the answer. I think so. <laughs> um, again, you know, will the vehicle take you into Africa? Look, any vehicle is going to take you into Africa. My question to you is, 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 what are you prepared to put as your boundaries? Okay, so how are you going to go into Africa and what are your, 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 your parameters you're working with? Okay, so can you fix it? Can you get spares for it? Uh, is it reliable? And, and let's just go around that with any vehicle. Okay. You can't fix so, it in. 
Well, you know, it's it, that's the challenge you have with any of the more complicated vehicles. You know, and yes, the, the early Land Rovers, I loved the early Land Rovers, the 300 TDIs and the TD5s. Oh, is there any car with as much personality as those early Land Rovers? I don't think so. You know, I've got a client now who we're going to build two Land Rover 110s for him and his partner, and um, yeah, he doesn't want a Toyota. He he's happy to build two Land Rovers because they have a soul, and he likes it. So Would it's, you be it's personal. To put a bigger engine in that? No. No, no, no. You know what? Once you start changing engines, unless it's a, a you know, a if, like if you said life. to me a like for yeah. like, if I'm taking the True P one HZ six cylinder non turbo motor, and I'm taking that out and I can change the engine and gearbox uh, into the Troopy, that's doable. That's a very great, it's a lovely modification to put a turbo diesel, the 1HDT, mm. with a stronger gearbox in. Fantastic. The 80 series gear, auto gearbox. Yeah. Well, I, I would say you could, I would preferably go with the manual ones. It's, you know, I suppose you could do both, I'd need to check with And the, the Parenti 3.9, I assume they put in the military spec uh, Defender? Have you got your uh, hands no, on the thing is. I haven't had that. They, they used to do the international 2.8 conversions as well in the early days. With the Cummins. Oh, no, the, it was the international. It was strong diesel. Yeah, it was, it was a, <laughs> you know, a lot of, lot of money. But again, you know, when you're going away from a brand and you're mixing another engine into a vehicle, you know, how well tested is it? How well tried is it? And if, if, you, if you don't know that it's an absolutely good conversion or the conversion's not done properly. So it's not about not doing a conversion. If, you, if, you, if someone knows that the conversion they're doing is absolutely bulletproof. They've tested it, they've had many miles of proven happy clients. Fantastic. But remember, when you take your Toyota into a workshop to get it serviced and sorted out and fixed up, you've got an engine that's very different. 